All right, y'all, we headed back to Africa for some more groundbreaking discoveries. In this video right here, scientists terrifying new discoveries in Africa that changes everything. All right, so if you knew, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Let's check it out. Is the so-called cradle of mankind, Africa occupies an essential role in the history of our species. Many years ago, the early form of man saw the light of day here, which tamed fire and developed clever tool technologies. In the African continent still hides countless archaeological mysteries, many of which are still waiting to be discovered and understood. Before we get started, be sure to hit that like button and ring the notification bell for more videos. Together with you, we want to take a look at several extremely unusual finds that regularly cause heated debates in the ranks of the experts. Circles We've cracked the human genetic code and are sending space probes to the furthest corners of the solar system, and yet we're unable to solve the mystery of the fairy circles. In detail, these are bare, almost circular spots in dry, grassy landscapes in southern Africa. In the meantime, however, it's clear that Africa is not exclusive to this strange landscape phenomenon. Fairy circles can also be found in Australia. With regard to the background to the emergence, the experts have to go into the field of speculation. Termites, geological factors, and the self-organization of nature are discussed as the creators of the mysterious bald spots. The fact that the structures are subject to something like a- Did he just say bald spots? <laughs> my bad, my brain went, my bad. <laughs> A fixed cycle of existence is no less mysterious. Long-term observations with satellites showed that the objects disappear after 75 years at the latest, just as mysteriously as they appeared before. Child of Tong it's well known today that Africa is considered the cradle of mankind, but it was not always so. When the so-called Tong child was discovered in South Africa in 1924, a deep shock ran through the ranks of conservative experts. As the oldest fossil of a human ancestor at the time, the sensational find confirmed a hypothesis previously put forward by Charles Darwin, modern humans come from Africa. Before the skull, which is more than two million years old, was found, the experts believe the cradle of mankind was in Asia. Although the Australian Raymond Dart discovered the fossil almost a hundred years ago, it is still one of the three most important finds in paleoanthropology. Senegambian Stone Circles Although the Senegambian stone circles are also referred to as the Stonehenge of Africa, they differ significantly from their counterpart in Britain in one respect. They are not a single structure, but rather a multitude of formations which are found placed throughout Gambia and Senegal. With more than a hundred stone circles and burial mounds spread over an area of 350 by 100 kilometers, the site embodies the largest concentration of stone circles in the world. It's not clear exactly when the first hewn blocks of stone, weighing an average of two tons, were heaved into the air. However, experts assume that most of the structures were built between the 3rd century BC and the 16th century AD. The question of whether the stone circles were built before or after the first burial mounds also remains unanswered. What these silent witnesses of the past undoubtedly tell us, however, is the social background that was necessary for the construction of the plant. Only a well-organized community could be able to put such a demanding project into practice. However, this point comes with a huge catch. We still don't know who really created the Senegambian stone circles. In this regard, the ancestors of the Jola people, the Wolof, and the Serer come to the fore in the debates. Homo Naledi the Rising Star Cave in South Africa is one of the most important archaeological sites of our ancestors. The absolute breakthrough followed in 2013. 
The researchers managed to open up a difficult-to-access passage that was brimming with ancient hominin bones. Since the access to the chambers in places no more than 20 centimeters wide, in the run-up to the project, a specific search was made for, quote, narrow and tiny helpers. With success, between 2013 and 2014, over 1,500 bones were to be recovered in the Rising Star Cave. Among them were the remains of Homo naledi, an extinct species of the genus Homo previously unknown to the scientific community. Initially, the researchers considered an age of up to two and a half million years to be conceivable, but as a result of detailed analyses, this had to be corrected down to a maximum of 335,000 years. The fossils show that Homo naledi was about one and a half meters tall and weighed between 40 and 55 kilograms. Since the finger bones were relatively long and strongly curved, it's reasonable to conclude that this species was an excellent climber. In I was about to say, showing how we can adapt to things, being able to, to climb trees and different things, we adapt very well if y'all don't notice. The same breath, the arrangement of the hand bones suggests that Homo naledi might have also been able to make and use stone tools. Why the mortal remains were recovered in the difficult to access cave chamber is uncertain. The investigation suggests that the passage was not inhabited, but individuals may have deliberately entered the chamber to deposit their dead. If this is correct, we would have to reconsider our current view of history. Until now, I thought he was going to say to enter in there as a form of being safe, you know, getting to safety. Not too many. If you get through those narrow passages and get, get wedged back up in there, can't too many things sneak up on you and just run up on you. But he just said, oh, that man, <laughs> I was not expecting that. This is correct. We would have to reconsider our current view of history. Until now, the burial of the dead was only attributed to modern humans and Neanderthals. Skystone. To this day, we're still puzzled over the true background of the Sky Stone. However, if one follows an old legend from the local population, the matter is clear. Originally, the bright blue objects were inhabitants of the sky. Because these aroused the wrath of God, they were turned into stones and smashed to the ground. After Angelo Pittoni came across the strange structure in Sierra Leone in the early 90s, it should arouse the interest of many international scientists. Material analysis showed that the heavenly stone is composed of 77% oxygen and 20% carbon and lime. The unusual nature of the object suggests that it is indeed extraterrestrial in origin, having arrived on Earth between 2,500 and 17,000 years ago. Over time, parts of the Sky Stone have come into the possession of various collectors who consider their mysterious treasures to be extremely valuable. Clerksdorp Spheres the hotly debated question that's arisen since the discovery of the ancient Klerksdorp spheres can be summarized as follows. Are they natural formations or artificial artifacts? If the latter is the case, a few more questions would have to be clarified because the objects are actually around 3 billion years old. So, who could have made them? The fact that we could actually be dealing with the relics of an unknown species is justified by the round shape, the hardness, and the surrounding lines. Discovered in some South African mines, some bullets contain a soft substance that crumbles to dust immediately when the outside is broken open. Even NASA is said to have admitted that the production of such perfect objects was only possible in zero gravity. So, are we dealing with the work of extraterrestrials that landed on Earth billions of years ago? What do you think? Tell us your thoughts on this in the comments below. Oh, it seems like we continuously circle back around to extraterrestrial. I'm just saying, it's, it's embedded in the history. Whether or not you believe or you don't believe, we always somehow find a way to circle back around to it. That's all I'm saying. Bird of Saqqara. 
It's 1898, when a most unusual artifact is unearthed in the ancient Egyptian necropolis of Saqqara. At first glance, the wooden object is reminiscent of a classic bird, but the strikingly straight wings have striking similarities with the wings of an airplane. As a result, the bird is still interpreted by some people as an ancient model aircraft, an assumption that, as is well known, is in stark contradiction to our conventional view of history, according to which the ancient Egyptians never took to the skies. Various experiments were carried out to check the artifact's airworthiness. However, the test runs did not produce a clear result. In some passages, the replica is said to have floated several meters through the air. The flight tests with motorized models were also very successful. Other researchers were far less fortunate. Their constructions fell to the ground like stones. But even apart from the airplane theory, the original function of the bird is unclear. The corresponding hypotheses range from a child's toy to the masthead of a sacred boat to a boomerang. Light Bulbs of Dendera we can all understand that the ancient Egyptians didn't have the means of writing down history the same way that we do today. Because of this, most of the information about their culture and daily lives have been lost to time. However, it seems as though the Egyptians wanted to do everything within their power to ensure that their history would live on for as long as possible. To do Until we figure out time travel. I think <laughs> y'all gonna call me crazy. But I be thinking about that sometime, bro. Imagine the one person who achieves and is successful at accomplishing time travel and can go back and see and bring back the information for the history. <sighs> To do this, they developed a complicated writing system that used images of common objects, such as birds and other animals, to document their history. These days, the writing style is referred to as hieroglyphics, and we've come a long way in understanding how this writing system works and have uncovered many stories that the writings relay. Though one of the most interesting stories to have been shared through hieroglyphics seems to show an ancient version of a light bulb that has, to this day, remained remain largely unsolved. The problem with images like this is that, as far as we know, the Egyptians would have had no reasonable way to create a rudimentary version of the modern light bulb. Though, by all means, the images and carvings that we have access to seem to show, in perfect detail, a depiction of a modern bulb. This has led some people to believe that otherworldly beings must have visited the ancient Egyptians and given them access to modern technology. These theories have been furthered by other drawings and historical documents that speak of gods and goddesses that may have once co-mingled with humanity. As far as we can tell, there is no definitive evidence of these, and many of these stories seem to be nothing more than hearsay, but we can't be so sure. This is because, according to researchers, the temple in which these carvings were found showed no evidence of soot on the walls or ceiling. This means that torches would not have been used in this area, or if they were, they would not have been used very frequently. So, if this is the case, how would visitors have been able to see the rooms surrounding them unless they had access to some alternative form of light, possibly a light bulb? For now, we don't know for sure what these drawings could mean. After all, the drawings... Y'all know me, I've been skeptical of this, this painting for some time, or this drawing some time, for some time, you know. But they're slowly starting to convince me that it might have been possible, you know what I mean? I just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. And looking at that drawing, it gives me that, but it also makes me think that that's something else. I don't know why, I just can't shake it. Drawings could depict an everyday object that would have been very common during ancient Egyptian times. In the years since, this object could have been lost to history and may have merely resembled a light bulb, rather than being a viable light source for the Egyptians. Hopefully, as time passes on, we'll learn more about these drawings and what they truly predict. Though, for the moment, we can't help but wonder if the ancient Egyptians may have had access to some ancient version of the modern light bulb.
bulb. What makes this discovery even more interesting is that in recent years, researchers have learned that the pyramids may have been able to harness the power of electromagnetic energy. The shape of the pyramids allegedly may be able to harness certain forces of nature, allowing the ancient Egyptians to have access to certain powers that, even these days, we are not able to harness. This theory has grown so far that certain Russian research departments have begun reconstructing models of the pyramids in their research. They've learned that, yes, the shape of the pyramids may have truly been able to reflect electromagnetic waves, potentially allowing the Egyptians to harness this energy. Whether or not they would have been able to use this energy to power things such as ancient light bulbs is an entirely different story, but it's certainly interesting to think about. You know how next level that is if they did stumble upon a way to create light? <laughs> Eye of the Sahara a huge meteorite crater, the result of erosion or the remains of the legendary Atlantis. The background of the enigmatic Eye of the Sahara has always caused the most adventurous speculation. This is mainly due to the fact that the history of the structure's origins has still not been fully deciphered. What is certain is that the ring-like structure lies in a Saharan section of Mauritania with low ring walls measuring an impressive 45 kilometers in diameter. In fact, the Eye of the Sahara is so massive that it can even be seen from space. For this reason, the object has been used several times by astronauts as a landmark. How did the Eye of the Sahara come about? The enigmatic geological structure that's located in Mauritania has posed many questions for experts over the course of countless decades. At first, the researchers suspected that the Eye of the Sahara, which is also known as the Richat structure, was created as a result of a meteorite impact. However, the fact that no impact rocks were found at the alleged collision point speaks against this thesis. Other theories are based on the assumption that the Eye of the Sahara was formed due to volcanic explosions. Added to this is the idea that the enigmatic structure resulted from natural erosion. In fact, the landscape structure is so large that it can even be seen from space. For this reason, as previously mentioned, the Eye of the Sahara has already served as an important point of reference for some space missions. However, there's an even more bizarre theory that has quite a lot of evidence to back it up. This theory is not new by any means. However, in the recent past, a YouTuber with the channel name Bright Insight proposed a theory that the Eye of the Sahara may have actually been the location of the long-lost city of Atlantis. According to this theory, the Eye of the Sahara fits all the descriptions that were provided by Plato when he encountered the city thousands of years ago. According to legend, the city eventually flooded and became consumed by water. If this is true, there are likely countless ancient artifacts buried in the sandy terrain. Bright Insight suggests that it's worth exploring and excavating the area to try to better understand what this bizarre structure is. His theory claims that many of the large formations that can still be seen on satellite images of the area show that large deposits of salt exist in the sand. He claims that these salt formations would have built up over the course of hundreds of years due to salt water previously running through the area. He feels so confident that his theory is correct that he's even offered a reward of $10,000 to anyone who's able to travel to the area and search for fish bones or other artifacts. His theory also details the writings of Plato and how several large gullies seem to line up perfectly with where Plato described rivers and other bodies of water flowing in and out of the city. Plato also claimed that there would have been bodies of both salt water and fresh water in the area, which seems to have been true as well. This theory has been debated by many mainstream historical researchers such as Graham Hancock, However, no one's been able to disprove this theory completely. In all likelihood, the Eye of the Sahara may very well be the resting place of thousands of people who perished in the flood that claimed the lost city of Atlantis, if such a city truly did exist all those years ago. The Lost City of Aten 
If we were to look back around 3,400 years in human history, we'd be able to see the ancient Egyptian city of Aten. This town would have been located about 5 kilometers from Luxor. The town was named after the Egyptian sun god who shared the same name. At least, that's what we've gathered from historical records that have managed to stand the test of time. For countless years, this city was believed to have been lost to time. However, in 2020, researchers managed to finally clear out the ruins of the town so that we can get a much closer look at what life would have been like all those years ago, and possibly even solve some ancient Egyptian mysteries. We don't know much about the town for certain, but we have reason to believe that the town may have, at some point, been the largest metropolis in all of ancient Egypt. We have evidence that suggests that the town would have been at the forefront of Egyptian culture, standing as a town where trading would have taken place, as well as countless other acts of business. By all means, Aten would have been the epicenter for nearly every important deal that took place in ancient Egypt and would have- I mean, this whole city here is like a, a, a treasure. I feel like they should put like a dome or something over that because the entire time I'm looking at this, I'm like, man, like this, this needs to be protected. It's so much historical data here and information, treasures and different things above ground and possibly underground as well. Like, seeing that stuff, man, and, and I get it, bro. They be fighting for a lot of funding. You know what I'm saying? To to continue on these these excavations and different things like that, man. So, I, be, I, I just be, man, I be feeling bad because at any moment, some of this stuff can be damaged. And you're talking about damaging some true, true history right there, bro. But epicenter for nearly every important deal that took place in ancient Egypt and would have likely been the most important economic and administrative town at the time. When the town was built, ancient Egypt would have been in its prime. The discovery and research surrounding this town have shed a lot of light on Egyptian culture, but the discovery has also provided us with many more questions than answers. Research and that's why I'm saying, bro, we have to protect it are hopeful that as they continue to uncover new information about the town, they may learn more about ancient Egyptian rulers. Mm -hmm. For example, we'd love to learn more about Akhenaten and Nefertiti, as well as their strange and seemingly random decision to move to Tel El Amarna. Since we know that Aten would have been dissolved around the same time, there may be information here that could help us understand what truly happened during that time and what eventually led to the downfall of Aten. The beautiful Sahara Desert. When we think of the Sahara today, we immediately think of images of seemingly endless sandy landscapes characterized by the scorching heat. A look at the equally countless and majestic desert dunes leads us to suspect that the Sahara has always been as dry and deserted as it is today. However, if we turn back the wheel of time by just 6,000 years, we would find a blooming green savanna paradise instead of a dry wasteland. So that's just like Antarctica. When we watched the video about Antarctica, they said it wasn't always the way it was. It was once something just like this, bro. Now you're gonna tell me that about the Sahara as well? <laughs> In the somewhat recent past, the Sahara served as a home for countless settlers whose grazing animals could help themselves to the lush vegetation of the regions as they pleased. Countless lakes, regular rainfall, and even a gigantic river were part of the normal landscape of the Sahara at that time. The corresponding watering hole, known as the Taman Rasset, was a torrent at the time that, together with its numerous tributaries, meandered more than 500 kilometers across the African African continent. If the riverbed, which has since dried up, was still carrying water today, it would easily be entered on the list of one of the longest bodies of water on the planet. As a result, many early settlers also settled on the banks of the Taman Rasset. The drying up of the once mighty river is said to have triggered a gigantic migration of peoples. Megachad, a prehistoric lake in Central Africa, was once one of the most important water resources on the continent. During its heyday, the lake stretched over an incredible 1.95 million square kilometers, making it around five times larger than the Caspian Sea. 
No modern lake could have rivaled these gigantic dimensions. The drastic change in the landscape of the Sahara took only the blink of an eye in the context of the entire history of the Earth. But what factors ultimately contributed to the fact that what was once a blooming oasis became one of the driest regions on our planet? Concerning this question, the experts are pursuing a number of different approaches. That's a good question because what's stopping it from happening right here where we are? How did the desert dry out? What is certain is that the drying up of the Sahara took place within a few centuries or decades. The people who were previously at home in the area were therefore forced to flee from the comfort of their homeland and withdraw to the south or into the fertile Nile Valley. If you follow the claims of some experts, it was not the natural change in the climate, but the indirect influence of the people of that time which transformed the Sahara into a huge desert landscape. According to this theory, livestock played a central factor in everyday life at the time. The cows, sheep, and goats that were kept there said to have massively accelerated the desertification that would soon begin. Since the livestock grazed or trampled the local vegetation, the ground below finally reflected significantly more sunlight than before. This fact could in turn have caused the atmosphere to warm up over the years so that the amount of precipitation also steadily decreased. The subsequent drought is said to have ushered in the beginning of the end of the previously green savanna. On the other hand, however, there is a thesis that the cultivation of arable land could even have significantly extended the glory days of the Green Sahara. According to this idea, the change from the blooming savanna landscape to a dry desert can simply be traced back to natural climate changes. This is because the Sahara actually went through these types of changes a few times before the final desertification that we all know of today. Conversely, it's also possible that today's dry land will be covered once again by green grasses, shrubs, and trees in a few thousand years, maybe even sooner. So folks, and now your opinion is needed. That's why I was about to ask the question as well. What do y'all think? Was it climate over time or was it man that caused the destruction and caused us the Sahara to form like that? I'm leaning towards man, you know what I mean? Man plus animals continuously grazing, but I ain't gonna put it past weather changing over time as well. But you know what I mean? These are questions that we have to get answers to because like I said, what's stopping it from happening here? That's my question. But y'all seamlessly get at me in the comment section, man. Let me know what you think and I'll stick around and stay tuned. Till the next one, I'm gone. Peace.